centre's website, the university's um, website. Um, okay, so my name is Maria Lopez. I'm Deputy Director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre. I am leading the centre together with my colleague, who is actually the director of the centre, Professor Luis Ryan, who unfortunately for us, she's on research leave and is travelling at the minute um, uh, for you know, related to her research and she will be with us today. Um, so Anna, our research um, and postgraduate office person, she is um, copy and pasting in the, in the chat some information about the centre and future events um which is, which are fascinating i am always fascinated by the range of topics we are all colleagues and members are presenting and of course you are very welcome to to present your own thing into these seminar events um and just email to me if you've got any questions or you would like to propose a topic but today we are here to listen to my wonderful colleague robin west dr robin west who is um <laughs> he's uh, my colleague from sociology. Um, he's a senior lecturer in sociology and his research addresses questions of cultural memory and contested representations. Recent work has explored the precarious interactions between an Italian mining community and corporate interests. Robin, you need to, to do a presentation about that topic too. And but he's here today to talk about his um, research in which, which is funded by um, BA Leverhulme, um, and he's investigating the effective processes and performance of collective memory related to the intersections of history of state violence, both authoritarian reparations, dark tourism, and the afterlife of victimization in South Korea. So, um, Robin, all yours. Before you start, just a very brief comment to our um, um, audience. So Robin will do his presentation, 40 minutes presentation, and then you will have the opportunity to make all questions to him. If you want to write your questions into our chat, just for you not to forget, etc., just leave it. And then we'll go through that at the end of his presentation. So Robin, all yours. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction, uh, which all sounded very grand. Um, okay, so I'll start off uh, this presentation really with what probably quite a lengthy introduction, but I just want to give some sort of explanation of where this research project has come from, um, you know, some of the processes that you know, I've gone through to where I today it's still an ongoing project um hopefully I'll, I'll manage to get more money from some funding body somewhere and uh, go back to korea and do some more interviews and and so on but i'll start um like i said by explaining the background of this research um so the image that's on your screen now is of the jeju 4.3 peace park which is on Jeju Island in South Korea. Um, the park itself uh, stretches across something like 395 square meters, and it's nestled in between Jeju Island's Oriums, or which are um, you know, long defunct um, parasitic volcanic cones and Mount Halla or Hallasan, which we see in the background. Um, you know, Jeju Island itself is a, um, is a site of natural beauty recognized by the United Nations, by the United Nations. So anyway, look, the, get to the point, you know, the, the park itself memorizes or memorializes an atrocity that took place on the island some 75 years ago. Um, the story is, well, if you can call it a story, it's a fact, uh, that some 10% of the population were killed by government-backed forces following an armed uprising. And obviously, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment and what Jeju 4.3 actually refers to. But back to the Peace Park itself. The park was built between 2002 and 2016 which in itself gives some sort of indication of the, the main themes of this presentation. 
basically that you know it's we're talking about an atrocity that not not only happened far far from here from the uk from europe but also happened you know a long time ago it happened in 1948 onwards uh, yet now it's become the subject of a memorialization process and also a call for an internationalization process the jeju incident uh, which itself is a strange way of putting it, but it's a term that's used. The Jeju incident has become the main focus of my research. But a few things probably need to be made clear first before I, you know, I get to grips with the presentation. One thing I really want to make clear is that my research is not aimed at seeking out the truth of what, like much of South Korea's post-colonial and its post-Second World War authoritarian history, remains concealed or partially revealed and subsequently contested. So I'm basically, you know, I'm not, you know, about seeking the truth. Um, that's been done elsewhere. I mean, you know, like uh, there's a, an ongoing truth and reconciliation process in South Korea that takes in, takes on board much of what happens on Jeju Island. Over the past years, extensive research has begun to address this by various academics and activists in South Korea itself, but increasingly it's drawn the attentions of historians outside of Korea. So, yeah, that's one point. You know, this isn't about telling the truth. I'll get to, you know, what that's about in a minute. Um, so that's the first point. Secondly, although I've engaged with the story, and obviously as a research theme, uh, you know, have to relate much of the narrative around what has become known as Jeju 4.3, I think the factually, it's not really my story to tell, or it's not my story to question. You know, it's a story that belongs to Koreans, um, and uh, um, you know, most importantly, belongs to the victims of what was an atrocity. So what I'm concerned with, and what is the main focus of this presentation, is how we, when, by we I mean non-Koreans, uh, relate to and interpret the way that the narrative around Jeju 4.3 is represented. So basically, you know, my, my research is really, you know, a sort of phenomenology, if you like. You know, if you'd want to categorize it theoretically. Added to that, uh, you know, it's absolutely clear to me that those involved in the memorialization of this atrocity and the truth seeking process do want this story to be known beyond Korea. So I do hope, you know, to some extent, my research, you know, makes some sort of contribution to, you know, these original aims of internationalizing th this particular history of atrocity and what I refer to as its afterlives. Right, so, like I said, this is a bit of a lengthy introduction. Much has been written about the memorialization of atrocity, and lately a lot of attention has been paid to the Korean case of memorial monuments. At least in a non-Korean context, such attention marks a comparatively new field of academic inquiry, which, mar which mirrors perhaps a general lack of public knowledge of Korea's past. Um, as uh, you know, in a recent book, the historian Eugene Park, he made some opening comments in, in the book on the status of Korean history. Uh, sort of pointing to the fact that even though Korea's brands or its global brands, things such as Hyundai, Samsung, LG, and so on, have gained a presence in many people's everyday lives, there are few people that are really aware of their orig origins, let alone the troubled and contested history that define much of the country's 20th century. In short, and this is the point, you know, Korea has had or at least South Korea and obviously North Korea has had a traumatic history beyond the Korean War or you know what was basically a civil war and the national division between the two Koreas. Um, so this traumatic history stretches from its 35 year colonial subjection under the Japanese through to the authoritarian grip of the South sorry on the South population by successive right-wing regimes. 
and that was you know basically between the end of the second world war so 1945 through to 1987. the modern south korean state you know has consequently been built probably largely on on twin pillars the twin pillars of anti-communist sentiment and the economic miracle that you know has, has made today south korea I suppose you could add to that, you know, an added measure of post-colonial identity reconstruction. Those that profess some knowledge of, uh, of, of you know, the reality, if you like, of South Korea sit either uh, either side of a generational divide, if you could put it like that, with the older generation sort of hanging on or retaining an image of the Korean War and also third world poverty. And then you've got a younger generation that are more attuned to you know, what's become known as the Korean wave, you know, in the form of K-pop, of various films, Netflix series, and so on. Alongside, of course, you know, it's rapidly globalizing cuisine. Even while current affairs, you know, constantly focus on North Korea's um, nuclear ambition, um and sort of associated attempts at peacemaking um and of course you know the korean war itself you know re remains in a in a state of armistice it's not it's not concluded um you know many people still struggle to lo as again as eugene park puts it you know struggle to locate korea readily on a world map so um you know that that's a sort of background where I'm, I'm coming from with this research, but also I, I, some explanation is definitely needed about this presentation's title. Uh, South Korea has numerous memorials that have um, a dual uh, yet related function uh, in terms of relating the country's history of repression and celebrating that repression's overcoming. So first, for example, um let me change slide first for example you know you have sardaman prison which is on the on your left hand side of the screen sardaman prison in seoul sardaman prison is a former japanese colonial prison uh it is to all to all extent and purposes a memorial to those that had lost their lives in the independence struggle i.e the independence struggle from japanese rule Although arguably uh, this overshadows its more recent history uh, um, in terms of the imprisonment and the torture of pro-democracy activists in the authoritarian post-colonial years, uh, at least until the prison was decommissioned in 1987. It then became a memorial hall or you know, basically a museum in 1992. Now, on the right hand side of the picture of the of the slide, you you've got um, what is the National Cemetery at Gwangju in South Korea. Uh, the city of Gwangju was the site of the 1980 massacre of what you could refer to as a citizen's army consisting of students and workers um, who yeah, were massacred by South Korean paratroopers who were sent to suppress a democratic uprising. So I think Gwangju City itself is probably best described almost in terms of being a, a memorial complex uh, consisting of preservation sites, uh, of you know, numerous mon monuments, a peace park based around the cemetery there, uh, and you know, this, this monolithic national cemetery itself. And of course, I know some of you may be familiar, the you know, Gwangju City has also become famous uh, over recent decades for its relationship to art. And in particular, it, it hosts the, uh, the annual Art Biennale or by the Biannual Art um, uh, Festival and many more things. So basically, you know, that, that's just a snapshot, the sort of, you know, the monuments that have arisen, you know, in the memory of, you know, these um, of literally South Korea's dark past, if you want to use that term. So, you know, this research has its origins in a visit I made to Sardiman Prison back in 2016. 
and then a subsequent meeting with a Korean colleague who pointed out uh, this issue of non-representation of the pro-democracy prisoners of Sardiman. This then took me on a journey from realizing the ideological contexts of the memorials in Korea and how these shaped the processes of memorialization and you know, and it led to an engagement with uh, the idea of dark tourism. Uh, again, I'll, I'll explain dark tourism for those who are not familiar with it in a minute. Uh, so many of Korea's memorial sites now appear in tourist guidebooks uh, and, you know, and therefore do tend to attract quite a range of overseas visitors. Um, I've also made you know, visits to, to Gwangju's memorial halls, the cemetery, uh, and also the, the Gwangju um, archive, which, which documents, you know, the events of 1980. I then discovered, after traipsing around various dark sites, the, the story of the Jeju Island atrocity. Uh, I then made contact with a small NGO, small non-governmental organization that had called itself Jeju Dark Tours. And Jeju Dark Tours conducted tours of the island's dark sites. Uh, but they were also involved, very much involved in an ongoing symbolic and legal campaigns to restore the honor of the victims of Jeju of the Jeju massacre back in the 1940s and early 50s. So, you know, one part of my research is that, you know, it's a, an article I'm currently working on. It tackles what I call the production of a memorial space. Um, and where I look at, you know, the material and the discursive aspects of, of memorialization. Right, having said that, this presentation, the one you know today, uh, addresses something that seems to be troubling me uh, during the research. And that is exactly how we, you know, as non-Koreans, as I say outsiders, connect to what amounts to national memories and therefore processes of more memorialization. And those national memories and memorializations are, are both distant in time and in space. So look, I mean, again, this is rather a lengthy introduction, but you know, I just want to you know, set this background out. Uh, my original search plan, research plans were to work with this NGO, Jeju Dark Tours, as they actually conducted tours, uh, but particularly tours that they were doing at the time with non-Koreans or non-Korean visitors. However, there was this little thing called the pandemic that got in the way. So in 2022, which was actually my, the time I'd arranged to spend in Korea as my research leave, there were still very tight restrictions resulting from the pandemic uh, that made this the original plans impossible. Uh, and they also you know, radically transformed the way that the NGO Jeju Dark Tours actually operated. So I ended up spending two months in 2022 and then the further three weeks in July 2023, um, during which I interviewed members of the NGO, a uh, representative of South Korea's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a journalist who had spent the past 30 years investigating American involvement in the Jeju incident, also, I, I spoke either through interview or informally with non-Korean residents of Jeju, also curators of exhibitions, and all of this alongside extensive site visits um, and documentary research. Um, and it's this sense of the way things are exhibited that really you know, forms the basis of this, this presentation, which um, you know, is focused on how we interpret images of, atroc of atrocity. So, like I said, this is a lengthy um, introduction. So, you know, the, the title is To Whom Does Memorialization Stroke Memory Speak? And it's concerned with what I suppose we can locate, at least theoretically, in questions of affect, and in particular, how we connect experientially to images that disturb, yet at the same time relate a traumatic history of violence. 
so as I said earlier, you know, they're distant, you know, these images that we encounter when we go to these uh, memorial sites are distant in a double sense. I think of memorialization almost in terms of an assemblage of different sites, um, uh, different sites of different images, especially artworks and even literature. Uh, this is what Shankin in a, a recent book about memorials refers to as acts of bricolage assembled in the service of a larger synthesis. And that synthesis being everything related to Jeju 4.3 in terms of national remembrance, tackling historical injustice, truth seeking and its internationalization and reception beyond Korea itself. So in an influential 2005 book, the art theorist Jill Bennett coined the term empathic vision as she argued that contemporary visual art uh, that is produced in the context of conflict and trauma is somehow unique and has an affective quality that can contribute to new understandings of the experience of trauma and of loss. And that again sort of underpins this, this presentation. Bennett goes on to argue that through art we can identify an extended concept of empathy, which allows us to make connections with people in different parts of the world whose experiences differ greatly from ours or from our own. As I mentioned you know, just, just now, after some time visiting the sites of atrocity and, ex and you know, related exhibitions in South Korea, and I suppose unashamedly subjectively, uh, sorry, and unashamedly subjectively, subjectively, if I could get the words out, I don't, um, uh, I don't know exactly how I feel about encountering these images and the related narratives. I don't really know how I should feel. Uh, and at times I don't really know why I feel as I do in some of these places and encountering various images. So, you know, it's at that point that towards the end of this presentation, I bring in this notion of the uncanny. There's also an add on to the title. Those of you that are actually bothered to read the full title. Um, it, it's towards an archaeology of empathetic connection. And I hope what I mean by this becomes clear by the end of the presentation. And it also, I, I'll admit, you know, it suggests that I'm pretty unsure about some of the arguments I'm making. So, you know, this presentation is perhaps more, uh, more of a question than, than anything else. Right, as I said, that's a pretty long and lengthy um, introduction, a bit of a mere culpa that says, you know, like I'm a bit unsure about what I'm doing here. So look, we better go back and explain what Jeju is, or Jeju 4.3 is, or Jeju Sarsam, uh, as it's known on, you know, in, in Korea. Um, okay, so look, um, as, a, as I pointed to at the beginning, Jeju Island you know, is a site of a historic atrocity that was committed against the civilian population by forces allied to South Korea's post-independence authoritarian government. Um, so why is it called 4.3? Well, it, it relates to the 4.3 refers to an uprising and then a subsequent massacre that took place from the 3rd of April 1948 until 1954, during a counterinsurgency operation against suspe suspected communist rebels and sympathizers. So what basically what it turned into over those, those years was the routine mass slaughter of the civilian population by government forces, you know, the police and the military, um, but also, you know, um, by right-wing youth militia. The, the right-wing youth militia were, consisted of people that had escaped uh, the communist regime in the north. This is slightly before the actual de facto division of the two countries. Uh, and they were sort of out to prove their allegiance to the sort of so-called democratic South Korea. 
Anyway, so, you know, the atrocities were committed and resulting in an estimated 30,000 of the island's population being killed. Uh, actual official records, you know, place the number at 14,000. But, you know, you know, research has shown, you know, there was more near that 30,000 mark. Um, Besides that, you know, during this time, you know, 70% of Jeju Island's villages were destroyed uh, and anywhere from 15,000 to 60,000 people who were mostly civilians, um, you know, um, you know, were either killed or injured. Um, Now, you know, one of the, I don't really touch on, on, on this in, in this presentation, but, you know, one of the controversies around it is also how this massacre was overseen by the, the what was then the, 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 the US government in Korea. Um, anyway, you know, the scale of the, the point would be the scale of the killings was systematically suppressed by successive governments until 1987. When under pressure from social movements, uh, you know, the, the reality and, and discussion and debates around what had happened on Jeju back in the late 1940s and early 50s re-entered the public sphere. Now, prior to that, any mention of 4.3 in the public sphere was more or less regarded as a criminal act. Uh, and, you know, for, I suppose, around 50 years, mere mention of the Jeju incident was punishable by beatings, by torture and by long prison sentences. Uh, so the image there, by the way, uh, that that's of, you know, the Jeju, that's taken in the Jeju um, 4.3 Peace Park. Um, and, you know, the, the gravestones in the background, if you can see them alongside the, this rather... Uh, I don't know what's the word, enigmatic sculpture. Uh, the graveyards, uh, or the, sorry, the gravestones represent the unknown victims of, of J.G. Sossan. Um, so look, what, you know, what's the relevance perhaps of, of, um, of J.G. 4.3 or J.G. Sossan, uh, at least, you know, in terms of research? Uh, the example of, of J.G. Sossan illustrates the living nature of traumatic victimization over time both primarily, uh, prim uh, primary, uh, and the sort of trauma that's inherited. And there is, you know, as we speak, you know, they're constructing a new trauma centre for, for people still affected by the events of 75 years ago. It also tells of the interrelated processes of earning victim status and how, even when this is met with forms of symbolic and monetary, or monetary reparation by the state, that status can be eroded. And although I, you know, I don't go into it here, that, that's certainly happening now. Um, you know, that erosion, you know, takes a place of in, in the form of contestations of truth. And that's been, you know, just last year and, and this year, that's happened repeatedly as Korea or South Korea shifted from, you know, a, a liberal, if you like, government towards a more populist government. Um, and you get the same old rhetoric that belonged to the authoritarian nationalistic past and its interpretations of incidents such as Jeju, Sarsan, by populist politicians and right wing groups. So in many ways, Jeju Sarsan has, you know, it, it's 75 years ago, but, you know, in many ways, it's still, you know, it's so relevant to political and social and cultural events today. Um, so what are the emerging research themes, one of which I touch on today? Well, you know, first of all, you know, the, the question of atrocity and the media of representation. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in, you know, the way the, you know, the events of 75 years ago uh, um, are presented or represented, if you like, you know, the, and these verge from, you know, realism through to the figurative. Uh, they range from, you know, victim testimonies to art as secondary witnessing. So what do I mean, you know, by secondary witnessing? Because in a way, this is quite important to the, the discussion I'm making. Uh, secondary witnessing refers to, you know, the process of representing a history, 
whether it's atrocity or whatever, but you know, mainly you know, genocide and so on, by artists who didn't experience the events firsthand. Now, the term uh, you know, secondary witnessing was developed by Dora Appel in 2020, oh, sorry, 2002, who uses the concept to demonstrate how contemporary artists confront the atrocities as a means of bearing witness not to atrocity directly, but via its memory effects, and how these effects have implications for the present, and if not the future. Uh, so subsequently, secondary witnessing refers to how art frames the past within the conditions of the present by resorting to documentaries and archives and so on. And that's important for, for Dora Appel um, because, uh, you know, it implies the use, as, uh, the use of representation as a means of, you know, resisting historical closure. Um, the other term I use there is a post-memory generation, which, you know, is now, you know, quite a popular term. Um, it was developed by Marianne Hirsch, and it relates to those artists, photographers, writers, who have inherited the experience of, of national traumas, such as JG 4.3, uh, and Hirsch, you know, particularly, you know, uh, discusses uh, this in the context of the Holocaust. So I suppose, you know, in a nutshell, the post-memory generation struggle with the representation of ghosts and images of cataclysmic violence. And, you know, what Hirsch aims to address through the idea of the post-memory uh, is, you know, the creative aftermath, if you like, of atrocity by highlighting the value of imagination as a restorative means of, of reparation, of, of righting the wrongs of the past. That's been picked up in Korea. The, um, the academic Don, uh, Dong Yong Ko has also developed the post-memory um, concepts in the Korean context to recover the real forgotten and repressed history of South Korea. Um, so rather cautiously in what follows, you know, I want to extend you know, this sense of secondary witnessing and the, and the post-memory generation, if you like, to include you know, these new audiences, you know, those relating to dark tourism and so on, the encounter these memorializations and images of past atrocities in South Korea. Now, um, I mentioned dark tourism, you know, and that perhaps um, you know needs some explanation. You know, it's it's one of those concepts that originated in academic discourse, but then has found its way into more public usage. Uh, perhaps, you know, with such generalizations distorting much of what it originally intended to address. Um, in short, the study of dark tourism set out to explore the reasons why um, uh, humans, have, uh, humans have been attracted to sites and events that are associated with death, disaster, sufferance, violence and killing. One core approach in the study of dark tourism has been that of what's been referred to as a thanatopic experience or thanatotourism. In other words, you know, tourism based around the experience of death. Um, and this is, as Stone in 2015 argued, you know, is a consequence of what he suggests is, you know, our contemporary society as being a death denying society. Uh, and also related to the quest for ontological security, you know, to making sense and meaning in our lives. Another dark tourist theorist, Cohen, suggested that, you know, this idea of thanato tourism can, can be understood, um, you know, as a functional substitute for, for religious institutions, which in the past enabled individuals, individuals to come to terms with their own mortality. So it's all quite a depressing thing in a way. Dark tourism in this formulation, therefore, sort of becomes a mediating institution between the living and the dead in the face of an inevitable and meaningful, meaningless death. So it's therefore, you know, at least according to this strain of dark tourism theorising, you know, contemplation of one's own death, and in particular, those memorials that are commissioned to commemorate atrocity 
of which are ten, you know, um, and which tend to attract foreign publics. Uh, you know, and these, you know, have clearly sort of fall into this this categorization. It's nonetheless, you know, it's a conceptual argument, uh, you know, that tends to point to unconscious processes in its claims that we we are contemplating death in our viewing of, of, of memorialized images of atrocity. Something that seems to clash with other interpretations of dark tourism that underline its educational function. So even if we acknowledge this connection with imagining our own deaths, it's not an oversimplification. Um, sorry, let me say that again. You know, it's, it's not an oversimplification of how we construct meaning and how we can develop empathy for a generalized victim and even attune us to issues addressing human rights abuses and also social justice more generally. And you know, we could go on and dissect it even further, these sort of debates around the practice of dark tourism. But I want to you know, draw attention here to the way that we conceptualize the practice of so-called dark tourism. And I think you know that this is relevant, you know, for, for what follows in this presentation. Was a, what also really comes to light, sort of almost a byproduct, um, you know, is a sort of a decolonizing aspect to to you know looking at dark tourism in South Korea. Um, and you know, there's a couple of quotes here that come from my interviews. The first one, you know comes from an interview I did last year with a Korea, South Korean cultural anthropologist who said, you know, one thing I can tell, tell you is that most people do not know the connotation of dark tourism in English. Dark tourism just means that we revisit the dark past and then reflect. So it's quite a good connotation in Korea and people are not aware of the English connotation. How can they be? Then the second quote which sort of you know, backs this up in a way. It comes from Ho Jun Hyo, who's the journalist uh, and also an academic. He's got a PhD as well. But he's the one that, that's been researching and actually publishing about US involvement in the Jeju 4.3 uh, massacre. He says similarly, you know, first of all, he says, so you're interested in dark tourism. And I said, you know, well, I find it quite a problematic term. And, he, and then he had this anecdote. He said, like, you know, last year I gave a lecture on Jeju Sarsan to Japanese correspondents in Seoul. And we were talking about dark tourism. And when I told them dark tour, they didn't understand. Why don't you understand that, I asked them. And they prefer peace tour rather than dark tour. Why do we have to use the Western style tour, he said. So for me, I also prefer the peace tour priest tour for lessons of history. This is a more proper term. I think dark tour, how can I say, is glued in darkness. So, you know, that's another context to this presentation. You know, how we, especially as outsiders, or, you know, I sometimes question myself, am I just a dark tourist when I, you know, do this research? How we relate, you know, to, you know, these representations of atrocity and the history um, more generally. Now, here's where it starts to get probably a bit difficult, if you're still with me. Um, I'm concerned with this idea of images, you know, so, you know, how we think about things. I've already mentioned the idea of uncanny, so I'm, I'm sort of building towards this. So basically, how do we extend this sense of broadening the concept, uh, you know, dark tour tourism in relation to non-Korean public? Now, here, you know, you've got these two images. Um, one's got nothing to do with Korea at all, but you may have seen it. Um, both, I think, you know, allow us to uh, sort of approach the, the question of, of um, you know, of, of reflections, the role played by images, uh, by images, interpretation and memory, and so on. But also makes us, you know, look maybe a bit more deeply into, you know, the actual practice of dark tourism. So the first image provoked, a, you know, a plausibly justified condemnation when it first went viral across social media platforms in April this year. It depicts the taking of a so-called selfie by a tourist at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial, 
in Germany. Oh, sorry, in um, ah, where's Austria? Ger no, oh, look, I've, my mind's gone blank here. Uh, as the tourist drapes herself across the railway tracks that carried millions to their deaths. Uh, okay, obviously not a legitimate selfie because someone's taking a, a picture of it. Someone just helped me there. Poland, of course. Thanks, Anne. I went blank there. <laughs> um, so look, yeah, you know, the she runs her fingers through that for her hair while leaning back and assuming a uh, seemingly central pose. So the image, unsurprisingly, attracted a range of negative comments casting judgment on the tourist pair's intentions, branding it as, quote, an out of touch picture, disrespectful and absolutely disgusting. Um, the second image was taken by me in 2016 at Sardinian prison in Seoul. Uh, an image is of a couple peering into a tunnel through which the, those executed by the Japanese were hurried away at the dead of night outside for burial. At the time, I was rather proud of the, of the photograph, you know, you know, being precisely in the right place at the right time, and the way that it seemed to be a convenient metonym for the voyeuristic nature of dark tourism. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you probably may not be able to see it, but the, you know, you've got this couple peering into, you know, the place where people are executed, and the, the, the slogan on the back of the guy's T-shirt says, enjoy. So look, you know, I've, I've displayed that image almost with a, you know, a sense of smugness of various conferences and so on. Uh, however, you know, since the circulation of this Auschwitz image uh, and their negative interpretations, I come to reflect further on the processes through which we impose narratives on images and subsequently regret the readily moral interpretations you know, such as I made with that second image. Um, I, here's the point, you know, I had no knowledge um, of the couple in the second image, although I took the photo, I don't know if they're Korean, and therefore subjects of Korean history, whether they're Chinese, European or American. I don't know whether they stumbled on Saddam and prison in the same way I had a few years earlier, whether they were visiting because of their guidebook, whether they, sh they share a passion for social justice and we're visiting a site on the basis of deep-seated convictions uh, and so on and so on. So, you know, in a similar manner, uh, you know, and, uh, this is just speculation, you know, but beyond the pose, you know, we have no knowledge of the intention of the couple in the first Auschwitz image. We don't know, you know, whether they're going into the, the memorial or coming out of it, you know, how they were affected, by what they saw and so on and so on. What it does suggest, nonetheless, is that you know they're certainly in touch with dominant cultural forms of, visual, of contemporary visual expression and the aesthetic of subjectivity. In other words, the necessity or the urge to take a selfie wherever you are. Now, how are we doing for time? Right. Um, there's a the. the the the, um, the sort of title to this slide is you know the double nature of images, and you know I you know I, I'm talking about how you know that we had to maybe understand images in in a, in a different way. Those these two images serve as you know sort of a, a starting point, and I'll go on to look at images of atrocity as they're ex exhibited on on Jeju Island. Um, so. Basically, you know, what, what I'm trying to get at this double nature of images, I, I, I refer to um, an art theorist called Hans Belting, who coined this phrase, the double nature of images, uh, and, you know, and how it spans, you know, we ha have to think in terms of how the physical and the mental image, you know, is, is constructed. Now, what do we mean by that? So Belting argues that a fundamental level, the question of what an image is requires a twofold answer. We must address the image not only as a product of a given medium, you know, be it photo photography, painting or video, but also as a product of ourselves, for we generate images of our own. And by that, he refers to dreams, imaginings, personal perceptions. And we play these 
you know, these sort of internal images out against other images in the visual world. So in other words, that we bring, when we encounter an image, we bring embodied experience to encounters of any representation. As Belting puts it, there are endogenous images which react to exogenous images. Um, it's an ongoing back and forth process, he, he argues, you know, um, and, you know, gets to the point where he says the image, you know, does not really exist on its own, for example, on the wall or whatever, on the screen. They only exist uh, and they don't also just exist in our heads. The question of the image, he puts it, is always related to that of the trace and the inscription. To put it simply, um, the image is neither in, for example, a photograph nor our minds, but exists in the intersection between the two, where embodied experience meets a representation. Right, that, that's probably confusing. Now, so look, what I'm trying to get at here is like, again, how, you know, we, we relate as outsiders to, you know, what can be sort of termed as, you know, distant suffering and so on, as, you know, is represented in, you know, memorial sites such as Jeju 4.3. Now, okay, you know, I, I'm sort of working within the field of victimology with this, uh, and Sandra Walk, uh, lay, along with others, Eamon Carabine, for example, uh, you know, worked over the past years to develop, you know, a sort of visual approach to victimology and criminology. So, you know, for Walkley and her colleagues in 2014, they point to how, you know, victimization, you know, has to be understood as a product of the interaction between the ways in which violence, trauma and suffering is individually and collectively experienced. Um, and they look at two different, you know, approaches. You know, the relative approach, you know, deals with the aftermath of violence as it's shared and or symbolised within the public psyche. And the sort of constructivist way uh, approach looks in the way that grief, loss, pain and trauma are represented, commented upon and mapped out in the media and also through criminal justice mechanisms. So basically, they're, you know, they're, they're calling for a reimagining of victimization that allows you know, a critical understanding of the processes the victim statuses are arrived at. And also, you know, they draw attention to acts of witnessing. We are, they put it, inevitably emotionally and morally involved as sense makers in relation to trauma uh, and then, you know, as self-reflected observers. We draw on culturally informed meaning. Now, that, um, uh, you know, that sort of, I'm mapping that onto Bay Belsing's sort of affective remodeled image, which defines the image in order to extend our consideration beyond specific media to encompass images that we generate corporeally. So, as I said, dreams, imaginings, and so on. Um, but you know, what's interesting about this approach is that it includes our bodies within the definition of a medium, because it's through our bodies we process, receive, and transmit images. Hence, he talks about you know the image is so much related to what's going on inside, but also outside those things we encounter. So you know, this amounts to a division between eternal and external representations, images in the world, and images in our minds becomes erased. It sits somewhere else. Now, that's the point I probably lost everybody, if not myself. Um, but what I wanted to get at, and I'm aware that time's whipping past, as normal with me, um, I, I sort of jump a bit here, like because, you know, what I'm trying to get at is, is that, you know, we, we encounter images on you know, a daily basis in exhibitions and so on and so on, many of which, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, are connected to atrocities. Um, now, I sort of stumbled across an art exhibition in Seoul last year, uh, and it was called uh, My, Mem My Your Memory. And basically, well, it, it dealt with the way that, you know, we have different memories of things. It might be a single event, but you have different memories. And I thought this is very interesting. In one way, it sort of justified some of the, the way I was thinking about, you know, the things I've just been talking about, about how, you know, not really sure how I feel about Encountering images, what I'm supposed to feel, how I draw on perhaps my own, you know, ex um, experience to interpret images and so on. There were two um, 
two uh, installations in particular. The first one was by Cecilius Bacuna. Bacuna, Carlos, you, I know you're there. You can inter you can uh, clarify the, the Chilean pronunciation. She's a Chilean artist and she had an installation called My Vietnam, Vietnam Story. And basically what she said there was how she interpreted political violence in, in Chile, but she was drawing on the images she'd grown up with by watching TV reports on the Vietnam War. Um, and that was very interesting because, you know, again, how the, 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 the memories and the memorialization, if you like, overlap. The second one was by the Albanian um, um, artist, Ari Sala, who he did in, in, um, in partnership with uh, Bosnian artist, Sejla uh, Kamaric. And it's called 1,395 Days Without Red. And basically, it was a very long 43 minute um, reenactment of the streets of Sarajevo during the siege in the 1990s. What's interesting about it was there's two versions of it by each artist. Uh, one, the first one by Ari Sala, is his memory of seeing, you know, the events on the news and so on. And the second version of it is the actual um experience of Kamarik who was in Sarajevo at the time um and the two are, you know are more or less identical the two video installations but there's little things where the memory is clear between experience and you know and watching if you like so that really sort of informed the, the approach I take but also like I thought well look you know if artists can use this sort of methodology you know, to produce these interpretations of violence and atrocity and so on, then, you know, is that not something we can build on methodologically, you know, as either victimologists, sociologists, criminologists, or whatever we, we you know, classify ourselves as. Um, right, at this point, because I've got so many images, I've just got to change the, the presentation. Hang on. Because I was far too heavy on the on the amount of images I had. Hang on, right, so let me get the second one up. There we go. Right, okay, we're there. So uh, moving on quickly, and I'm aware I'm I'm aware I'm using up a lot of time. Um so you know going back to JG 4.3 with with these sort of theoretical things in mind, uh, you know, okay, so first of all, you know, how is the this atrocity, the events of, of 1948 onwards, you know, represented, if you like, within the memorial exhibitions? And there's a number of them around Jeju Island, you know, not Chester Peace Park, there's ones as well. Um and th th there's various ways it's shown, you know, that I, I'd say, you know, sort of bounce between realism and, and sort of figurative representations. If we think in terms of, of realism, then th that that in itself is is, is rather strange uh, sort of um, um, approach. Not the the you know, those organised exhibitions uh, intend this, but they they draw. Or they show a video that's probably about 15 minutes long uh, that was made by the US Army in 1948. Um, and it's called Jeju Do May Day. Jeju Do means Jeju Island uh, May Day. And it's very graphic. It shows dead bodies. It shows various atrocities happening. It shows the horrified uh, reactions of Jeju Islanders and so on and so on. But the thing is, you know, this... Um, this Jeju, Jeju Do May Day film, May Day film, is, you know, it draws on real images, but much of the, the way the narrative is put together is fictionalized. It turns the whole story round. It makes it look like, you know, the burning of villages was actually carried out by the rebels, you know, involved in the uprising, when in fact it was the, the right wing militia generally. So, you know, there you've got this way, this fictionalizing of fact. But I think it's very interesting, you know, how we interpret it, how we understand how these images are presented. Um, so, you know, one thing I'm trying to get at in this presentation is the way that, you know, the artwork, you know, is central to the way we interpret 
events of the past, such as Jeju 4.3, Jeju Sarsen. So in that sense, you know, we're talking about, you know, media, mediations, you know, the, the, that thing, again, the, the way images are presented on one side to tell the story, but also how we interpret them. Um, yeah, so, you know, I refer to this as aesthetic mediations as historical agency. Here's an example. This, um, this is about Jeju. It's about the experiences of, of mothers on, you know, during the Jeju massacre. And that's a theme that I'm going to develop on the, the final slides. Um, this image here is, is, is um, called Gaze. I mean, at least that's the you know, sort of literal interpretation of it. Um, it's of a woman holding a baby. Her, her, mouth, you know, her, her face is covered by her hand. Um, and um, basically, you know, like it's interpreted as saying, in Korean, somsum hera, which means hush. In other words, you know, the mother is condemned to silence. She can't speak of the events. But the point would be, you know, in the gaze, all is told in the eyes. Um, the artist, uh, Park Young hoon is part of the, the Minjung art movement that emerged in the 1980s. Very political um, um, movement very much concerned with restoring people's place in the art world, if you like, and they just want to sort of realist, realist aesthetics uh, and aim to, you know, to, you know, make people the subjects of the communicated act through their artworks. And they saw art as a social practice, a cultural reproduction, oh, sorry, a cultural production, and also the critique of social and historical conditions. Now, Kenyon Park, you know, he's writing, you know, uh, sorry, writing, producing his artworks in the late 1980s, years after the actual event. But in that sense, he is part of this secondary witnessing or the post-memory generation that's keeping a story alive. Uh, there's another one here, uh, again, Return of Jiro, and this, refer this was actually produced this year, um, but it refers to the, a mother receiving the remains of her lost son who was killed in the uprising in the 1940s but whose body has only just been recovered from a mass grave and so on now okay the point i'm trying to get to you know i'm trying to take you back to dark tourism and so on is that you know we encounter these images and they obviously have much more cultural meaning to the korean population than they might do to us if, especially if we don't know the full story so you know as i said on the previous slide perhaps art you know has to be seen in that sense of being as we put it a um where are we as a you know, an aesthetic mediation, as historical agency. This is a, a, um, um, a three-minute animation by the artist Park Jae Dung, uh, Park Jae Dong, sorry, and, and it's shown in the um, the Jeju Peace Park Memorial Hall. It's based on, well, actually, it tells the story of the events that led to the Jeju uprising and the massacre. It was basically, you know, a, a democratic protest that then, you know, got out of hand for various reasons and ended up in the police firing on civilians and killing a number of them. But it sparked the whole thing off. Um, now, here the animation draws on what's, you know, a very popular art form, or, you know, popular form in, in South Korea called Webtoons, a form of animation that originally appeared online that then sort of, you know, it was incorporated in the Korean manhwa, or in other words, you know, the, the Korean version of manga. And so, you know, the point I want to make here with this is that, you know, this is a new way, perhaps, of presenting those stories in what could potentially be a sanitized form, but perhaps one that speaks to new generations. Um, where's my notes gone? Um, yeah. You know, especially in an age with the dominance of social media, you know, webtoons like this and, you know, this sort of representation have become, a, you know, taken on a political dimension. They play with form, you know, to generate representations of lived experience, you know, a personal, historical and cultural archives and so on. And they do this almost through the plasticity of their form. In other words, you know, they play with mixed codes 
mixed codes of reality, of fiction, of history, of audience affects, uh, and various narrative arrangements, and so on. So they offer a form of historical realism, you know, and especially in this case, you know, one that relates very much to questions of human rights and social justice and so on. Um, so, you know, there, you know, you've got this again, perhaps this is a, you know, an art form that perhaps can, you know, be used to, um, you know, we, I suppose we could call it a third generation of witnesses, you know, through a popular cultural form, the story lives on, it's retold in new ways. Um, other ways, I, I'm getting towards the uncanny here, other forms of representation, of course, as they do in me memorial, you know, museums across the world that, you know, talk about atrocities from the Holocaust to Sarajevo to wherever. You know, there are videos of, you know, survivors' testimonies, such as is on the left there. But also, and this is the thing, like, and I suppose this is where you can bring the uncanny in. Authors like Mark Rothberg have, have talked about the Holocaust, um, you know, in terms of multidirectional memory, the, you know, the, almost like the Holocaust has all come the reference point for atrocities on a global scale. So the picture on the left, on the right hand side is, is what's known as the industrial alcohol factory. It was back in the 1940s, um, a place, you know, it, it produced industrial alcohol, but then it was turned into a sort of concentration camp for, for, for Jeju Islanders. Many of them were told they could go there for safety, but a lot of them are actually killed there. Now, the thing I, I say, you know, we can bring in the notion of the uncanny in here is, I know that's a pretty small image, but you can see the chimney above the factory and the smoke that, that's coming out of it. That smoke is actually imposed on the, on the, on the photograph, yeah? Um, and, you know, I think there's a real reason behind this because, you know, it, it immediately, we draw on our knowledge of the, the Holocaust of the Second World War the Nazi regime, you know, that, that imagery is sort of embedded in our minds to speak of the horror of concentration camps, of, of the death and so on and so on. In um, the, the, the caption below that, when translated, you know, says, you know, the industrial alcohol factory, an Auschwitz style concentration camp. So, you know, in some ways it's interesting that, you know, there you've got, you know, we have to draw on our own sort of knowledge of a violent past, if you like, and genocide, you know, to really make sense and bring out, as it says, you know, there, the sort of the moral weight behind, you know, th this incident or this location in the Jeju massacre. I hope that makes sense, yeah. Uh, interestingly, I, I suppose, you know, like just tangentially, you know, the, the South Korea has drawn extensively on the German experience of reconciliation, the way it memorializes its past to inform its own approach to tackling its, you know, South Korea's own violent and dark past. So, look, um, I, I, I know I've gone quite over time here, but, you know, let's just go back to this idea of memorialization. I, you know, I'm going to sort of develop this idea of, you know, A, of victimology, and secondly, of, of you know, the sort of sense of the uncanny. This sculpture here is of a woman um, who, oh, well, okay, it's a sculpture of a woman hold, holding a baby, clutching a baby in the snow. Uh, it's called Bissol, which roughly translates into fluttering snow. And it appears at JG4. It's a sort of centerpiece, if you like, of the JG4.3 Peace Park. It's the, the woman herself. Um, you know, she she's a real historical figure. She was found by villagers on the on the on the slopes of Mount Haller in the snow, dead with her baby. She'd been killed by the right wing militia. She also lived very close to where the um, the, the peace park is now built. So she sort of become this iconic image, if you like. But here's the thing: like, you know, first of all. Um, Choi wrote a book quite recently, she's a Korean American, about you know various memorializations in South Korea, and she visits the, the Jeju Peace Park. 
Uh, she says something quite interesting because again, I'll just you know refer you back to what I said right at the beginning. I've seen I've, you know, I've stood in front of this sculpture several times, and I don't know how I feel. And I'm moved, but I don't know why I'm moved. Um, which probably you know takes more explanation than I'm actually giving. But Troy says, you know, JG female victims throughout history appear to have endured multifaceted victimization as ideological suspects of being communist, as objectified bodies, as sexual violence, as exploited workers of the gendered workforce, as sole breadwinners, and finally suppressed mourners of loved ones. And referring to the sat statue, she says, the faceless female body with a baby effectively dramatizes the intensity of brutality inflicted on a community. Yet it can also be viewed as a valid critique, suggesting an archetypal pieta like image. In other words, image of the Madonna and cradling the, the, you know, the dead Christ that projects the reductive identity of womanhood. Thus, this statue barely provokes visitors to imagine the complex layers of life condition, or sorry, life conditions that JG women have undergone within the specific local context of the atrocity. And that got me thinking again, because, you know, like, I suppose in terms of the uncanny, you know, like these pictures seem to dominate. Uh, also, again, these images of, of the dead mother seem to, you know, dominate many artistic representations of, of JG 4.3. And in that sense, I say, they're almost like the iconic images. Um, and they are nervous. And I think that's, you know, the, the original Freudian, you know, um, um, you know, formulation of, of what the uncanny is, you know, these repressed repressed feelings, if you like, that, that disturb us and so on and so on. I'm not sure why I find these images disturbing. Um, Freud, you know, perhaps rather, you know, controversially refers to the uncanny in terms of, again, you know, of the suppression of the memory of birth, you know, and he refers to the, you know, the process of birth and the female genitals and so on and so on. I'm not sure, um, you know, that that's something I, I'm sort of working around, especially through the work of, of Julia Kristeva and others, but not for now, that's not for now. But certainly this sense of uncanny is there, but also, you know, there's this sense uh, I think, you know, of, of what we bring to this, you know, this sense of, um, you know, interpreting on the base, interpreting images on the basis of our own experience. You know, my first sort of thought, and let me go back, I've jumped ahead, like, my first thought on seeing these images was to draw on my criminological knowledge. And I thought, well, look, you know, it's certainly the ideal victim, the woman, you know, as you know, the innocent, the baby as the innocent, and so on. The ideal victim being, you know, in, in that sense, you know, the the not the typical victim, but the sense that, you know, the, the one that's easily representable as, you know, as as receiving full victim status. So, you know, again, I, I originally, you know, encountered that image with that sort of experiential knowledge behind me and I thought hey you know what does this actually mean uh, also you know th this thing about what what Troy says here about these images you know sort of being a reductive representation of womanhood so you know again you know these images are everywhere now I think it would be another presentation on its own to talk about the status of women in, in Jeju society, let alone Korean society. Uh, that's for another time. But, you know, again, you know, like it's a way that these sort of un invoke the uncanny. But at the same time, you know, as Troy said, you know, is this not quite a reductive sort of representation of womanhood that doesn't speak of the full experience? Now, I know from my interview that, you know, the, the the Jeju women, you know, with most the majority of their men either killed or you know disappeared, you know, had to rebuild Jeju society, and they went to great lengths to do that. Some of which would have been socially unacceptable at the time within that culture. Yet they are, you know, literally survivors who rebuilt Jeju society. That image, you know, that reduces it to the victim doesn't really talk about the, the afterlife, if you want, of these women. Now, to be fair, that is coming out. There's a lot of, of, um, of uh, testimonies being published and, and also acquired from survivors, uh, although they're in their 90s, 
now and the families you know, of, of victims of, of JQ 4.3 that really you know, relate the full experience of womanhood after it, after the event, up to today. Hence, as I said earlier, you know, they're, they're building a trauma center now to deal with the long term effects of what happened 75 years ago. So, look, I'm going to finish here because I've gone on for too long. Um, which loads of you that know me is typical of me. Um, so look, I mean, you know, what Troy is pointing to, like she points to this uncanny nature of remembrance of the Jeju killings, referring particularly to the unknown energy of the dead that plays a significant role in mourning rituals as well as memorialization. The site of memorialization itself uh, is itself designed as a form of improvised mediation between living and the dead offering a lens through which you understand the experience of victimization. She says that the uncanny element lies in an uncanny transformation materiality. In other words, you know, like that statue, you know, it, it, you know, these poignant images appear to be imperishable. But, I'm, you know, my, my question, like I said, this presentation is more a long, elaborate question than, than you know conclusive sort of you know arguments where else might we uncanny you know we encounter the uncanny before you know beyond materiality you know going back to our own interpretation of images based on experience and so on you know so what cultural resources do images of atrocity and victimization in the past actually bring to the surface and does the uncanny help us even perhaps the exoticized distant suffering through what Belting refers to as a double nature of images. And at that point, I'm stopping with some references. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, that was oh, very good. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was a wonderful presentation, very thought provoking and very timely. Um, I, it made me think a lot about my own research, but also about things that are happening, yeah, in other parts of the world that um, you kind of anticipate what will happen in the future. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, like in, in response to that, Maria, I mean, what I would say, like, you know, when last year I, I arrived at Jeju Island from Seoul in, in April. And I was preparing to go to memorialization thing. You know, it was April the third uh, at the Peace Park, and of course, you know, I'm looking at uh, the Guardian online mm -hmm. in the morning over breakfast, where you know there is images of atrocity of, of vic you know civilian victims lying dead in in Ukraine. Yeah, and I thought, wow, you know, like this isn't just the past. Now, not to mention what's going on in Palestine and Israel at the moment. You know. And, and particularly the you know the way I think this is so inherent in what I'm, I'm discussing you know the how people are awarded victim status you know that's certainly what's going on you know at the moment uh, you know in, in the Middle East you know raises these questions of you know how we approach a question of who's the the what's the word uh, you know the deserving victim again to sort of use criminological um, yeah parlance. You know. So sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean it's fascinating your presentation for many various reasons. To begin with, you are kind of um, looking into that from a very interdisciplinary perspective. Um, and coming myself from cultural studies, um, I can see all these um, as you talk about representation, imaginary, memory, um, and discourse, narratives, etc. Um it is very, very interesting. But before I keep on talking, I could be talking with you. And actually, let's meet for a coffee and keep on talking about this. I just want to ask people, audiences, I mean, our audience, if they've got any questions they want to ask Robin, you are more than welcome to write in, your, in the chat or connect your your mic. And um, so I can just, um, and you can just, you know, ask him directly if you've got any kind of questions about this wonderful presentation. Just feel free, please. We are so, you know, we're so few that um, we can just start a conversation at different, you know, um, levels. So please, you know, just raise your hand, connect your mic, write your comment, whatever um, method is fine. Um, but yeah, so Robin, just coming back to 
Oh, we have, of course, someone, Carlos. Carlos, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robin, for your presentation. I'm going to practice you, Spanish with you later, but, you know, we're doing well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Look, with you know, well, first of all, I'm from Chile, as you know, and I have a lot of experience being in places, memorials of violence in Chile or Argentina, many of them. One of the things that I've discovered throughout my years working in these places has been the important role that victims or descendants of victims play in the display of these memorials or these museums, mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. because it helps to avoid the commodification of, of images um, of violence, right? So to what extent in Jeju Island, the memorial, what role has uh, Korean victims or descendants of victims probably having yeah. the displays set up in the memorial? Do they have any at all or it's just organized by the directors of the museum or the memorial or state actors? No, no, absolutely. They, they play a central role. I mean, like, you know, just to, to mention, first of all, when you talked about, you know, your experience in Chile, you know, like um, the, a book came out a couple of years, probably last year or maybe the year before. And I forget the author's name at the moment, but she does a comparative thing of the truth and reconciliation process in South Korea, but also in Chile and somewhere else. I can't remember where. So, yeah, those, pa those, first of all, those parallels are, are certainly there on a global scale. Now, to answer the second part of your question, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the, the local population, you know, play uh, uh, you know, a central role in, in, the, in the rituals, you know, surrounding Jeju Sarsang, yeah? Um, you know, on an ongoing basis. I mean, you know, um, I put it like this. There's there's many institutions, whether they're non-governmental organisations or um, uh, you know related to the state or whatever on Jeju Island, that, that deal with the memorialisation of it. You know, I spoke about you know this NGO Jeju Dark Tours, uh, but also you've got the the, the original one is, is the Jeju 4.3 Research Institute. That was established in 1989, I think if I remember rightly. Uh, and the journalist I mentioned earlier, he's actually part of that as well. Uh, so you've got these like institutions. There's also the Jeju Peace Foundation, and so on and so on. In fact, Jeju Island now it, it sort of promotes itself as the island of peace. Something that a lot of people actually you know take issue with about what it actually means. But I mean, so you know. Across the board, Jeju Islanders are involved with it. it it's a scar. It's you know, it's a scar on the memory of, of practically all Jeju Islanders. You know, everyone will have a family that was affected, or family members that were affected, one way or another, by the events of 1948 through to 1953. Um, I, I mean. It's you know this is a long answer to your your, your question, but you know there, there's so many issues. You know I, I spoke about the right wing militia that came and committed most of the atrocities on Jeju. Um, uh, I, I I found out you know this year when I was there that many of the though they actually many of these right wing militia actually stayed on Jeju and married into Jeju families. But there's a whole thing about silence around them. No one will speak about them. And, and that's part of what they mean by peace and reconciliation. The, you know, these people have committed atrocities, but they're, they're, they're now part of the communities. And, you know, at least the, you know, the descendants are. But it, there's this whole wall of silence. You know, it, it's not spoken about because not speaking seems a form of reconciliation. Uh, to take that further, and again, you know, more directly answering your question, you know, Jeju Island is, you know, there, you know, um, how can I put it? it? It's very much still influenced by Confucian values, but also by shaman or shamanistic values. So, you know, all the rituals around memorialising jeju sarsam you know will you know, inevitably have some sort of ritual shamanistic in you know input to it so you know in a sense you know there's a religious connection uh the you know is part of the narrative the broader narrative of of, of jeju island you know and so you know the short answer is you know practically everyone is in, is involved in one way or another 
I make a distinction actually, like you know, between what I call professional activists, like the person that founded the JG 4.3, uh, sorry, the JG Dark Tours uh, group. You know, she's you know got a, a history of professional activism, either in Korea, I think also in Thailand and so on. And she's she's from Seoul. Um, now. You know, other members of, of the group are actual Jeju Islanders. In fact, you know, she's now left that group and she's gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But, you know, the person that's taken over is a direct descendant of one of the victims of of the atrocity and so on. So in short, yeah, I mean, Jeju Island, it, it, you can't separate Jeju Sarsam from everyday life still, I think, on, on Jeju Island. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you, Robin. Cheers. Okay. That's a long, long answer. Nearly as long as the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> it was very interesting. Thank you, Robin. Does anybody else have any question mm -hmm. for Robin now? You can connect your mic or write it into the chat. No, not anybody. No, no. Okay, so can I can I ask you, Robin? Um can. This is very interesting how you talk about this um, clash of terminologies and concepts. Mm -hmm. That sometimes that you are having problems to, as an outsider, as you define yourself, um, mm -hmm. co coming from a completely different environment, cultural environment, you approach these um, people and try to get immersed in their uh, kind of national debates in such a complex situation without you know, wanting to be superficial and just wanting to be, I'm sure, pathetic and sympathetic with their feelings, terminologies. How do you, my question to you is how how do you manage to do that? How, what are the big problems and difficulties you have having to not only reconciliate yourself and start using uh, that terminology, but also start using the own scholars as in your bibliography and references, etc. I'm saying that because that is one of the big challenges that I've got in my research about Mexico to start listening and reading to them, to the Mexican scholars, and trying to import the terminology. And sometimes I'm not very welcoming to you know, to use that terminology into this side of the world. How do you manage to work on that? Do you find it challenging? The terminology in what sense, but particularly things like dark tourism and, and stuff like this, or yeah. or, or yeah, I suppose the short answer is yes, yeah. I mean, I do. Um, um, oh, gosh, that's, that's quite a question in a way. Um, I think you know, like the the long way into that um that answering that is. I suppose, you know, first of all, I make, you know, like the, the terrible fallacy of, of not actually speaking Korean, you know, so a lot of my interviews and, you know, documents I work with have to be translated. Um, mm. And that in itself, can, you know, like has, has given me a lot of stumbling blocks about the way actual Korean words that might be conceptual are actually translated. Yeah. And I think in a way, you know, that that that's what I meant, like, with that bit earlier about how dark tourism, you know, like it, it, it doesn't have the same connotations for Koreans as we, you know, we do now. So um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at, but, you know, think, I mean, it's an ongoing struggle in a way, I suppose, to really, you know, like think in two different conceptual worlds. Um, yeah, because I think that sometimes as colours, we are, you know, we take all this extra work yeah but you know you need really to be aware that you're doing research about it. it's such a completely different you know environment cultural environment social political environment etc mm -hmm. they as you say they are speaking a different language they've got their own imaginary their own conceptualization mm -hmm. narratives etc and it's got a lot to do with the language itself so yeah. to me it's one of the main challenges because it's not only yeah. about translation but you also have yeah. to be, and, and the example you gave about dark tourism versus peace poor is a very good example, you see, because what yeah. to you, yeah. was in the global north in Europe, is quite straightforward yeah. translation. We keep on adding and the adding all this terminology for them. Sometimes it's a bit, um, you know, difficult to cope with. 
and sometimes they yeah. find offended themselves and um yeah so to me and when talking with people doing research about different countries and different you know um places they find it very challenging and sometimes this is an invisible struggle that we are dealing with yeah. all the time and we don't yeah. even realize you say yeah so uh, yeah. no i mean I, I think you know going back to what i said right at the beginning if you can remember that far back you know it was uh you know i i sort of got to the point where i'd say well look you know like for a number of reasons primarily that i don't speak korean uh but more than that you know like this is not my story to tell the story of jg 4.3 or jg star sam you know it's about how we as non-koreans interpret it you know bearing in mind that you know all those involved in memorialization say that you know we want this story to be internationalized we want you know just remember you know like the koreans didn't know about it until you know late 1980s 1990s mainland koreans coming to the island now and taking part in these tours you know do not really know that history of their own country you know so it's the task of others to tell that story you know that that that's clear to me yeah obviously i have to draw on it but I'm more interested in how, you know, in terms of internationalization, how we approach and how we connect to, you know, to something that is so distant in both in both senses. You know, like it's long ago in the past and it's not just far away geographically, but it is, you know, like it, it's the cultural memory of a different culture who in turn probably have, you know, different interpretations of cultural victimization and so on and so on. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, of course yeah. it's a struggle. You know? And I, I probably put more barriers up to myself than, than necessarily need to be there. But yeah. Yes, to sound empathetic and understanding their situation, we tend to create barriers and uh, absolutely. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? No? No. Does anybody want to make a comment about their own research? whether they feel, you know, the same with their own research and how they manage to, you manage to sort this out. No? I've got another question, Robin, actually. Okay. I, I thought, I, I found very, I mean, fascinating those images that you showed about uh, women, mainly mm. women, yeah, and motherhood and all this, um, you know, um, in the even in the fictionalized stories and um and you know mainly because my research about women you know migrant women on the transit from Mexico etc I'm quite sensitive to the females um representation of females narratives women women narrative etc I just wanted to ask you because you mentioned something very interesting and I totally agree with you you said at some point that bodies um that you found that bodies are in the center of all these narratives and memories and dreams and imaginations, female bodies. Did you say something about that? Did you, something similar? I've worded in a different way, but you said that in this renegotiation of collective memory, you found that bodies, mm -hmm. female bodies, or the representation of female bodies were kind of in, you know, central to all these discussions and, and motherhood. Which I found very powerful. Those images of motherhood in the middle of all these dramatic events, protecting their kids or, mm. or babies, etc. I found that very, very powerful. So I just wanted to share with you. Uh, in my own research, I also say that you know, I'm you know, women bodies are in the central of all this migration process, etc. Very much in your line, and it struck me something that I heard to a uh, Mexican scholar actually, Varela. He said that um, yet yeah, we mention those bodies and we see those bodies in your presentation, well, which are quite weak and protective mm -hmm. and motherhood, and and possibly they are just protecting their kids from bombings or whatever. But at the same time, they're strong bodies. They are oh, very yeah. much vehicles of resistance. Mm -hmm. And how you use your body as the strongest part in you to protect, physically protect. So I find very interesting this dual approach to women's body as something weak and, and very often abused um, and in danger and sick and tired, etc. But at the same time, we find bodies, women bodies as giving birth 
falling in love, protecting their kids, dancing. So I find very, very interesting. So I just wanted to share that with you in case that in your analysis of, of images, and we, because you said that you were mm -hmm. struck by them, but you have to think why it struck you, why you got like interested in those images. And perhaps it's because more than Freud and his theories, it's just because mm -hmm. The idea of women's bodies have that dual, um, you know, a face um, which is protected, weak, and so, so protected, and yeah. at the same time, protected, a strong and powerful vehicle for resistance. I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, I, you know, to be honest, you know, it, it's something that I'm struggling with really you know going back to what we were saying you know just previously about you know like you know, the way we interpret other un understandings and that you know like i um you know yeah i mean i suppose the, the first way you think about it you know the, like the, that statue for example that sculpture for example is moving it is moving you know it has an effective quality i i you know we should, well, I don't think you can deny. You know, maybe it's because it's life size. Do you know what I mean? You know, like you're almost with the person. Now, as I said, like um, I, I, you know, this is this goes back to this sense of interpreting the image based on your own experience. You know, and all those things you're saying, you know, that that comes to mind first of all. Well, after you get over the the you know the initial emotion would be well hang on this is you know as, as Troy says you know isn't this quite a reductive sort of representation of woman that you know that draws it back to childbirth and the maternal role and stuff like that which in itself is, is problematic because it's a it's a real life you know it's a true event you know that, that she was found dead you know um you know clutching her child in the fluttering snow hence the name of the, the sculpture and you know, and, and at the moment, that's a bit of a stumbling block for me because, like, you know, I, I don't fully understand, you know, the, um, the role or the status, if you like, of women on Jeju Island because it's not simple. It's not simple. Um, you know, Jeju Island is, is actually famous for, I don't know, you might have heard of the Hanyo, which are the women divers. The women, the free divers that, that dive down, you know, to collect, you know, seafood and so on and so on uh, and they very much have been like the main breadwinners in in you know mm. jeju island um economic life if you like you know and so you know there's a status first of all of, of women you know it, it's um it's it's you know it, it's something i'm not clear on if you like you know like so again, you've got that that same thing about you know the, like the the interpretation you bring to something like that sculpture and, and what the actual what it actually represents you know in the in the Korean mind or in the Jeju mind you know is, is perhaps something different. Um, I do think there is something in in what Choi says about this you know it being a reductive image. You know I know from interviews I've done, particularly with the anthropologist that I, I mentioned during the presentation, who's who's been working on, on a project with a, a Jeju women's group that have been collecting the testimony, you know, oral histories of you know the they have very old survivors you know female survivors of the, the atrocity and you know she was telling me you know like, there's things that they went through you know to reconstruct society you know which all relates as you said to you know to the, the body you know particularly you know like you know as not just as mothers but as main breadwinners many of them resorted to, to sex work to survive you know because you know the, the males were not you know not present and so on and yeah. all these stories you know which it just complicate it even further i think so the short answer is i'm not sure you know like i'm not sure about you know this yeah it's, you know like there's that, that that sweet potato factory you know the, the industrial alcohol factory that you know, i showed you know that's now um Last year when I visited it, when I eventually found it, 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 it was what remains of it. You know, it, it was just a, an old site and they started to build a memorial there. Now it's got quite a sophisticated state-of-the-art memorial hall there. 
Uh, it's just across the road from from uh, the ferry, the main ferry port in the harbour at Jeju Island. And when you come into the ferry port at Jeju Island, you're met by a massive statue of semi-naked women that the was supposed to represent Jeju, you know, Jeju womanhood, which, again, I think this is rather tasteless or, or you know, like it's got a, a symbolic meaning that I don't really understand or less have not yet understood. So, you know, again, you know, the, the depictions of, of the female body, you know, exist in various forms in J.J. society. Yeah. Gosh, that was a bit of a long winded answer. But <laughs> it's still a conundrum. Yeah, so I'm still working on it. Yeah. Good. No, I mean, it's just fascinating. It's just fascinating. The topic It's so good. So, yeah. Wish you the best with that. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, does anybody have any question um, for Robin? Or we should just grab up? Um, it's it, been a... It's tea time, I think, isn't it? I know, yeah, um, yes. Um, it's been uh, great to have you, Robin. Um, I just want to thank you for agreeing to do this presentation. It's just, um, it's just so good to get the time to look into colleagues research and get to know what we are all doing because this is a quite an isolated um you, you know for profession really and uh, it's always good to get out of the box and see what colleagues and just trying yeah. to understand all the relations and synergies we all have in our research um so um just for our, our audience the six participants thank you so much for staying until the end have a look to the website, the center's website. Uh, Luis and I are organizing um, these, even, uh, these events, and we are very much looking forward to receiving all of you, having you all as an audience. Um, and just for me, Alain, if you want to present your work in the center, you, you, you know, I'm sure I'll see you around in the next events we'll have. They are fascinating too. Um, so yeah, if we don't have anything else to add, um, thank you so much for coming all today. I will just um, stop the recording and uh, just uh, watch in the, um, have a look to the website, to the uh, research website in YouTube, and this presentation will be uploaded in the next week or so, if you want to use it in your, you know, classes, etc. Thank you, Robin. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Just kind of